I pray that you're joining us in the great adventure reading through the Bible in three years. Uh, Many people have never read through the Bible and been Christians for many years. And so we're doing this adventure together, and our reading, our weekly reading, is mixed with the message every weekend. And we're reading now currently in the book of Numbers. And as we're reading through Numbers, uh, I have chosen chapter 16 of Numbers. So if you have a Bible, open up to Numbers chapter 16 as we share with you the rebellion of Korah. You know, there's something that drives rebellions, and it's, it's really simple. It, it's not rocket science to try to identify or diagnose a rebellious heart. It doesn't matter if it's a rebellious person on the ball team or in the classroom or in a family or at work. Selfish ambition, your own desire to do whatever you want to do, irregardless of how it affects everybody else, the Bible puts its finger on it and says that is the issue. It's a selfish ambition, a desire to achieve something that, for whatever the structure system is, that you cannot have. And so there's a rebellion that rises up. And in this story, there's a man by the name of Korah. And Korah influences so many people in the nation of Israel to rise up in rebellion because of his own selfish ambition that by the end of chapter 16, about 15,000 people are dead because he leads these people into rebellion. Because this is the thing you've discovered, haven't you? Though we're going to talk about the rebellion of Korah, every single one of us have rebellion in our hearts. And we can connect like a magnet to metal with rebellious people because in many regards, some of us are rebellious twerps. We're people that want to rise up and we love to battle the establishment, whether it's the manager and everybody talking badly about them in the break room or uh, the coach is not doing the job that we think, so everybody rising up and wanting him to be fired. Um, a, a wife that does not want to be submissive to her own husband and, and, and trying to figure out that whole dynamic. Each one of us, there is a rebel inside of us. So we're going to talk about a guy by the name of Korah. But you see, God's word is like this, the Bible says. It's like a mirror. And if I hold up a mirror right now to you and I showed you really slowly and it, it, you could see it clearly, who are you going to see in that mirror? Well, you're going to see yourself, aren't you? I'm in that mirror. And there is a rebelliousness in me that God has had to deal with in my life. He's had to eradicate. He's had to bring me to brokenness and repentance and transformation because I don't want to destroy relationships because of the rebellion in my own heart. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're going to see how Pastor Moses deals with this rebellion. And more than that, we see the rebels. We see those who are being rebelled against, which is Moses and Aaron, and ultimately they're rebelling against the Lord, and how the Lord is going to supernaturally step in and discipline the children of Israel. And I want you to know, as you see this story and what takes place, you should be extremely grateful for Jesus and being under a covenant of grace because some radical things are going to happen to these rebels. As I said, about 15,000 through discipline are going to die. Well, let's look at this scenario as we start off with the first three verses of Numbers chapter 16. Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and on the son of Pilath, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel. 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? Now, the leader in this passage of Scripture is quite clear. Not only in this passage, but in the New Testament passage, that basically gives us, describing false teachers, it gives us three icons of people that blow it big time in the Old Testament and to be a lesson for you and I so that we don't have to do it. We don't have to mess up in this way to experience consequences like they have. Now, the beauty about God's Word is you can learn from people without doing the same stupid thing yourself, right? I mean, there's two ways to learn. I can make all the mistakes and kind of go through my own hard knocks, self-inflicting um, adversity on my life, or I can learn from other people that have kind of made a mess of things. That's the benefit of being the youngest out of four kids. You have three older siblings, and you watch them, and they begin to do that. You go, that didn't work out well. And you see this next one, that didn't work out. And this one does it. Oh, wow. It's amazing how much you learn being the youngest of four, because you see what not, what not to do. And 
In this passage of Scripture, we're going to learn that from Korah. Look in the book of Jude, the New Testament. These three icons are described in one verse, verse 11 of the book of Jude. It says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Now, the three lessons that those three men teach, we're going to look at Balaam next week. So we're going to see the heir of Balaam. The way of Cain was jealousy, anger that led to murder. He killed his brother Abel. That's the way of Cain. Some of us struggle with a temper. We struggle with jealousy from others, and it moves us to murderous, hateful words. Maybe not the physical act, but we struggle with the way of Cain. Others are motivated by greed like Balaam, and that is a really hamstrings us in life, if you will. And then there's the rebels, and that's Korah. Now, Korah here, as he lays this out, he has got together with a couple of right-hand men. Korah is from the tribe of Levi. He is Moses and Aaron's cousin, and he is of the family of Kohath, which has the sweetest opportunity to serve God in the house of God. He is entrusted, their family is entrusted with the special articles, the Ark Ark of the Covenant. They get to carry these things on poles. Now, he has a great privilege, but it's not enough. He really wants Aaron's job. That's what he wants. That's what Korah wants. And he recruits a couple of people from the tribe of Reuben. Their names are um, Dathan, Abiram, and a guy by the name of On. And then they recruit 250 representatives of the nation of Israel. It says, men of renown. They're famous men in Israel. They are the movers and shakers, the most powerful, influential men of all Israel. Korah has stellar skills at leadership. It's just sad that his heart's so wicked that he uses those skills for leadership to be destructive. You know, some people are really skilled with their words. They're skilled with leadership. They just lead in all the wrong things. No matter what you think of Adolf Hitler, you got to say, the guy was a strong leader, right? He just led to destruction rather than to good, beautiful things. And so that's what Korah does. He leads to destruction. And in this, they say, you know what, Moses, Aaron, we've had it with you guys. You take too much on yourselves. You've been around too long. You you know what, we're we're tired of your leadership, and we think that we know best, and, and we want you out of the way, and Korah really wants to be the high priest in Aaron's spot. That's what he wants. Now, where there is selfish ambition, there is every evil thing. Look what James says. He identifies this. It says in James chapter 3, verse 14 through 18, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, Gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruits of righteousness is sown in peace by those who, what? Make peace. There are people that want to please God to walk in love and joy and peace in the family, in the church, in the work environment, in school, on the team, wherever it is. They are people that they exercise, they show by their conduct that they are a person that walks with heavenly wisdom. But there are other people that are motivated by selfish ambition and better, bitter envy towards others that they can justify their actions and they will never lack for an audience. Why? Because in every single human heart, there's a rebel ready to be stirred up if you don't pay attention to your own life. How do church splits happen? Where does divorce come from? Where does this, somebody gets selfish. That's the bottom line. Somebody gets selfish and says, I want my own way. And so that's what Korah does. Now, as he rounds up all these people, and there's Korah, Dathan, Abiram, On. These are the four prominent individuals. Korah is the most prominent. And there's 250 of men of renown, famous men that are representatives. And they all come against Moses and say, we're sick of you. We're sick of you and your leadership. You and Aaron both. We've had it with you guys. You guys need to move aside. We're taking over. We know it's best. Now, I love Moses' response because Pastor Moses, this is not his first rodeo. I've been a pastor for 26 years. This is not my first rodeo. I have went through ups and downs and rebellion and envy and jealousy and people wanting their own way. And you just have to just stick to your guns because, you know, you guys remember that Moses didn't want this job in the first place, right? Right? He, he didn't want the job. Five times he told the Lord, you just, 
get somebody else, man. I don't want this job. Who would, who would want this job? 40 years, I'm wah, 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 wah. Who wants it? Nobody wants it. Moses doesn't want it. Aaron, he just got brought into it because Moses asked for help, and so Aaron supports it, and God says, okay, my man is Moses and Aaron, and God put these two in this place. But these people, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they act like Moses and Aaron took it upon themselves. Just as over the years I've had conflicts of all sorts because church is filled with drama. People are like, how come you get to be the pastor? I said, I don't know. I don't know. If I was, I've told God, if you're going to pick somebody, you should have you chose better because I'm just like all messed up, right? And so I'm the first. When people want to complain about my leadership, I'm like, amen, brother. Isn't that awful? It's terrible. I agree with them. It's not like I, I think that I got it all together. I'm like, man, you should pray for me. I'll pray for you. You pray for me. But this is what you have to understand, you guys, and this is the thing that Korah says. Korah says, all the congregation is holy. They're all God's people, so therefore, how come you get to exercise leadership? We could say the same thing today, here today. All of us are holy, right? We're God's people. We're, we're Christians, right? But this is the, what you have to discover in life, is that though we are all God's people, everybody has different callings and authority that goes with those callings, because God's not a God of disorder. Look at a couple of passages that help you have the right perspective about this. Psalm 75, verse 6 and 7. For exaltation comes neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and he exalts another. There is no authority in your life. Your boss, your father, your uh, pastor, whatever. There is nobody that is an authority operating in this life that God has not allowed to be an authority above you. And this is the greatest lesson that you have to learn in, the li in life is that there is authority all the way through life. And what I have to learn through God's grace and God's help and the Spirit of God is I have to learn how to lovingly, peacefully submit to authority. Children have to grow up in a house where they submit to the authority of mom and dad. Does that mean there's a difference of equality? Is mom and dad better than a son or daughter? Absolutely not. Am I better than you? Absolutely not. Was Moses better than Korah, Dathan, and Byram? Absolutely not. We're all God's people. We are equal in his sight. There's an equality, but there's a different role. And the role and authority is different. And so, you know, as a child growing up, you have to learn how to submit to your mom and dad so that when you learn that, you can go to class at school and submit to your teacher. And then you get a job, and then you go there and you submit to your boss, or you go into the military and you submit to your officer, or you drive down the road and you submit to the police officer because he has the authority, and you have to learn how to submit. But you know what I see? Oftentimes, even within the congregation of the Lord, an immature Christian is people kicking and screaming against the authority that God has put in their life. Coming to church, oh, my boss is such an idiot, and you just go on and on and on, right? And don't you realize, I, I smile because, don't you know, God kind of has a sense of humor, you guys. God knows what you need, and the reason you have the boss that you do is because you need that. <laughs> Isn't that great news? I don't, I don't need that. No, 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 you need that. You need to learn how to surrender. Mm, was right there till that moment. Okay. But the reality is, is that in this moment, in this moment in your life, God has put authority in your life. A wife struggles with submitting to her husband. And they look at me, Pastor, I just can't submit to this guy. I said, well, you, you married him. I mean, somewhere along the line, you loved him enough to marry him, right? Yeah, I know, but I didn't know him then. Well, God knows what you need in your life, and so he blessed you with the man of your dreams. And you know what you're going to get to do? You're going to get to figure out this throughout your life. Isn't that exciting? That's so exciting, right? And a husband needs to learn how to submit in loving his wife and being kind to her. So he has to learn that, right? You have to learn it all through life. There is no area of life where you escape authority and submission. None. You say, well, I'm quitting this job because this job boss is a jerk. Great. You can do that. You have freedom. It's America, right? Quit that job. Go over there. But you know what's, who's over there? A boss. And who do you take with you? Who seems to be the trouble? Who's the common denominator in all your trouble for the last 10 years? You are. You are. Because you haven't taken a look in the mirror. Somebody's calling you to tell you that right now. Reach out and touch someone. Okay? So, I love what Moses says here. 
Check it out, picking up in verse 4. This is how he responds. Now, this is the way to respond thing to these kind of charges. So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. You just got to go. Moses spent so much time on his face, I think he had one of those boxers pug nose, you know, from just hitting the turf. And he spoke to Korah and all his company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show who is his and who is holy and will cause him to come near to him, that one whom he chooses. He will cause to come near to him. Do this, take censers, core, and all your company, put fire in them, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it a small thing to you that God, the God of Israel, has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord, and to stand before the congregation to serve them? And that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brethren, the sons of Levi, with you? And are you seeking the priesthood also? Therefore, you and all your company who are gathered together against are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? Moses does three things. I want you to take note. Pastor Moses, I have taken note. Rather than get in Korah's face, he falls on his face and humbles himself before God. When I run into this kind of rebellion, the best thing I can do is get on my face, humble myself before God, and ask for God's intervention. Number one, he gets on his face. Number two, he says, tomorrow we're going to sort this out. He doesn't let rebellion or division linger. He nips it in the bud. He says, tomorrow morning we're going to take care of this, fellas. And number three, he takes a last-ditch effort to speak some sense into their head. He says, what are you guys doing? You have the greatest privilege of the tribe of Levi. You guys get to serve in the house of the Lord. You get to serve around the tabernacle. You get to serve God and serve before the Lord. But then lastly, he says, you guys, your rebellion, it's not against me. It's not against Aaron. The anger in your heart and the rebelliousness that is motivated by your own selfish ambition is envy, self-centeredness, And you're rebelling against God. Because all rebellion, ultimately, no matter if there's a face, a woman, a man, whoever's in your your mind's eye, ultimately, rebellion against authority is all rebellion against God. And they didn't get that. Because this is the thing. When we are filled with our own self-centeredness and our own pride, it distorts all reality. The Bible says share the truth and love. Do you know the definition of truth is reality. It bring bring you into reality. And Moses tries a last ditch effort to bring them into reality. And anywhere in this whole process, you guys, I want you to know that Korah just had to say, you know what? Um, Please forgive me. I just just got sideways. At any time, there could be repentance and a change of heart. Any time. But you don't see it. Because they are so blind in their situation. Now, he also has a conversation not only with Korah, but with Dathan and Abiram. It says in verse 12, Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram the sons of Eliab, but they said, we will not come. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. You will, will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. They talk some trash to Moses. They said, we're not coming up. You said you were going to bring us into a land of milk and honey, but you didn't do it. You took us out of a land of milk and honey. Egypt, that's not true. Just like in Korah's situation, uh, Moses is like, what's your deal? Your, your beef is not with Aaron. It, it's with God. But now Dathan and Abiram, they're saying Egypt was a land flowing with milk and honey. That's, that's not the truth. And why didn't they get to go into the promised land of milk and honey? Because they all rebelled against God. That's why. Was it Moses' fault? No, Moses was filled with faith. He was ready to go in. You see, this is the funny thing about pride, self-centeredness, and rebellion is it distorts all the facts, and it has to find a person to lay blame on. It's just the way, way it is. Somebody's got to be the fall guy. And so in this case, they say that it's Moses. Now, Moses, just like he didn't get in Korah's face, he fell on his face before God. Now he doesn't get in Dathan and Abiram's face. They won't even come and have a conversation with him. He prays and he tells God about it. Look at verse 15. Then Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey for them, nor have I hurt one of them. So you say, You know, Lord, I want to tell you about it. 
He's very angry, and what he does with his anger is he points it towards God in prayer. He can do that because that's the where, where I should take my anger. Rather than attacking people, I really have to just take it to the Lord in prayer. And in this regard, he says, I've never taken a donkey. I've never taken a bribe from these guys. I've never hurt one of these guys. I can never remember a time that I hurt these 250, Korah, Dathan, Abiram. God, you know my heart. You, you see this. I, ha- haven't, I don't know why they're so upset, but I haven't done anything to them. So God, don't listen to them. Don't respect their offering that they're going to make tomorrow morning. God, just, just don't listen to them. So God's going to honor that. Now he declares in verse 16, Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow, you and all your company be present before the Lord, you and they as well as Aaron. Take each, uh, let each take his censer and put incense in it, and each of you bring his censer before the Lord. 250 censers, both you and Aaron, which uh, each with his censer. So every man took his censer, put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. Notice verse 19. Two radical things happen. Korah gets the whole congregation now there against Moses. In verse 19, And Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. But who steps in at this time? Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. Then where's Moses go again? Then he fell on his face and said, O God, the God of spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Then Moses rose, went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. What a crazy thing. In this moment of this conflict, of this rebellion that has risen up, the Lord shows up and he says, you know what, Moses? Moses? We're going to discipline all the people. In a moment, I'm going to consume all these people in their rebellion. And Moses intercedes. Now, most people, if just think about it. If the Lord came to you, you're a man, you're a leader. The Lord says, I've had it with all the people. We're just going to make a new nation because God already offered this to Moses. We're going to make a new nation of you. I'm going to torch all these people, and we're just going to start over with you. Yeah, it might take us another four or 500 years, but hey, I got all the time of eternity. And most people, most men would say, right on. I like that idea. Let's fry these troublemakers. And let's have a new nation. We'll call it the nation of Rick. Sounds good. <laughs> Sounds good. But Moses doesn't do that. He doesn't, he, he doesn't want anything to do with that. He's like, God, just have mercy because one man has sinned, Korah. Now, there's a lot of people involved, but he says, no, the instigator's one. He said, shall one man sin and the whole congregation be destroyed because of one rebel? Well, if the influence has brought all of them to the door of the tabernacle to fight against God and his plan and his leaders, well, it's pretty scary. So the Lord says, okay, Moses, you tell everybody, you get away from those tents. Get away from the tent of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And so everybody scatters. They get away from them. He says, don't touch what they have. Don't be around them because lest you be pulled in. Now, this is the thing about a self-centered, self-interested, selfish ambition in a person's heart is they begin to draw coworkers, people in a congregation, people in a family. They begin to build a following. Watch that over and over and over again. And they begin to play upon the people's rebelliousness in their hearts. Now, the New Testament tells us that we should avoid people like Dathan and Byram just like they're supposed to get away from the tents here. And can I share with you, everybody gets away except those who can't get away. Who can't get away from Dathan and Abiram? It doesn't say this about Korah, but Dathan and Abiram, their wife, their sons, their daughters, and their little children because they're connected to them. They're connected to them. And so who begins to suffer because of the person with selfish ambition? The family does. If you've ever known somebody that takes their, drags their family through drama after drama after drama because of their own selfish ambition, they stir up their wife, they stir up their kids, they create all kinds of havoc, it's really tragic because ultimately they suffer the same fate as the rebellious person. But everybody else can get away and does get away. As a matter of fact, it tells us in 
for us in our own dynamic of church life. It says in Romans chapter 16, verse 17, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. If somebody starts causing problems and division in a church, you're to mark them, you're to note them, you're to, you're to take note, and you're to say, I'm going to stay away from that person because they just want to cause problems. It says in Titus 3, verse 10 and 11, reject the device of man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. After a divisive person is warned twice, then you're to reject him and say, you know what, you're just a troublemaker. Now, can I say that the, the same thing at work? Maybe there's five or six people underneath a manager, and one of them has that selfish ambition. He actually wants the manager's job, and he's always undermining and always trying to get that person fired, and, and he starts pulling you into it. Can I just tell you, distance yourself from that person because it's not going to go well for him. And if you hook your wagon to them, it's not going to go well for you either. So pay attention, right? I, I pray that this is not your first rodeo, meaning that, hey, this is just the way people are, correct? And so if we want to be who God wants us to be, we're not going to hook our wagon to those individuals. And so in that, there's one, though, it, say, it doesn't say that about Korah, that his children were there. As a matter of fact, when we get to chapter 26, just a, a few chapters away, it says specifically that Korah's children did not die. Look at it, it says it in Numbers 26, verse 11, Never, nevertheless, the children of Korah did not die. You say, well, what's up with that? Well, Korah might be old enough where he's an empty nester. His kids are old enough to make their own decision. And by implication, let me just kind of color in the line from many observations that I've had over the years about human nature and about families and about rebels, is that ultimately when children grow up in the house of a person that is always obsessed and causing problems in a family, at work, in church, the, fa the kids, the sons and daughters finally grow up and say, you know what, that's just dad's deal. It's just what he does. That's mom's deal. That's just what she does. She's a troublemaker. Ever she wherever she goes. I love her. She's my mom. I love him. He's my dad. But you know what, you guys, brothers and sisters, let's just back off because this is not our deal. God, dad wanted this, and we even talked to him last week. Dad, don't go down this road. Don't do it. It's destructive. And we're not going to have anything. We're not going to have any part of it. As a matter of fact, because of that, his lineage went on. And they became the famous descendants that were the sons of Korah that wrote beautiful psalm after beautiful psalm in the book of Psalms. You might remember a few. Psalm 42, as the deer pants after the water brook, so my soul pants after you, O God. Who wrote that? His descendants. You see, they made a decision in their life. My father was a rebel. My mom was a rebel, so to speak. But I'm going to be a person that is known for the praise of God in my heart and on my lips. They wrote another psalm that I love, Psalm 84, verse 10. For, for a day is in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Who said that? His descendants did. And so somebody had the good sense that we're close enough around Korah to realize that if you hang with my dad, you're going to suffer for it. You're going to pay the price because he is a self-centered filled with selfish ambition, grasping outside of his realm, man, that his whole life brings that destruction. Now, the Bible says, cast out the scoffer and there will be, be peace. And so, look what happens now. In verse 28 through 34, Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. For I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally, like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. Sounds like a good test. But if the Lord creates a new thing, check this out, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord." Notice they didn't re reject Moses. They didn't reject Aaron. They rejected the Lord. Verse 31. Now it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. Then all Israel who were around them fled at their cry, for they said, lest the earth swallow us up also. Moses says, you know, this is a great test. Don't you think this is a pretty good test? I think this is a good test. 
God, who have you called? Well, if you guys die naturally, then God hasn't called me. But if God does a new thing, I mean, this is not your average thing. It never happens in the scriptures. This is the only time it happens. God just opens up the earth underneath the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and everybody that is with them. He just opens it up. They go down alive, screaming and yelling as they're descending. And then the earth just closes up like they never existed. Say, what? Now, I think some of us should be... extremely excited that we're under this covenant of grace so that the earth is not opening up under our rebellious feet. Correct? I'm with you guys. I would have been swallowed a long time ago. Right? Can you imagine if this was church Sunday morning? Well, you know, if you come here and hang out, rebels, they get swallowed up. Well, pastor, how was the Sunday service? Well, we had three people accept Christ and three got swallowed by a hole. And so, uh, you know, if this keeps happening, we're going to have to have a mortician on staff just to take care of the dead bodies that we have every Sunday morning. I, I don't know how that would go for church growth. How about you? What, what if at work, that troublemaker that is at your job site, what if the earth just opened up and swallowed up and then just closed back over the top of him? That person that is uh, causing this divisiveness. Now, I want you guys to know that this is nothing new in the congregation of the Lord. Because do you know that the very first church split that was motivated by pride and selfish ambition started in heaven? Because that's what Satan did. We, we see him called Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14, starting at verse 12 through 15. Check it out. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like most, the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Do you know that Lucifer... We know him as Satan, the devil, the dragon, that serpent in Genesis chapter 3. This individual, this angelic being, said, you know what? I don't think God's doing a good job around the universe. As a matter of fact, I want to be God. And you think, well, I mean, is that utter stupidity or what? It's pride and it's selfish ambition. And realize he was such a skilled leader in the heavenly realm, the Bible says that he drew a third of the angelic host with him. Do you know that the first church split, the first real rebelliousness that was manifest was in a perfect heaven with a perfect God was sin in the heart of an angelic creature? So should it surprise us when there's rebels in the church, there's rebels at work, there's rebels on the ball team, there's rebels at school, there's rebels at... Does that shock you? If it can happen in heaven with a perfect God, and I want you to know that there is no perfect humans, but God was perfect. But pride and selfish ambition took him down that road. And all of a sudden, he was swollen in his own importance. And five times, this is called the five I wills of Satan. I will take over God's kingdom. I will. I will take over my boss's spot. I will get that pastor fired. I will, you know, get the coach fired, whatever it is. Because where there's selfish ambition, there is every evil thing. So the earth opens up, swallows them up, and closes, and man... They just disappeared. They just disappeared. And I've discovered this. If I'll fall on my face and I'll trust God and I'll try to nip it in the bud, take care of it quickly, if I try to last-ditch effort to try to talk reason into people's hearts and lives that we're going through the process with, and then I'll trust God to defend me, then God just takes care of it. And you know what? Those people just, they just seem to disappear. The earth doesn't open up and swallow them up. They just choose to do something else because ultimately they realize that God has established something that all their grasping, all of their pride, all of their uh, divisiveness can't get the job done. But in 26 years of being a pastor, 31 years in, in the church, I have seen drama after drama after drama. And I want you to know, wherever is there, there's a problem, wherever there's a problem, all you have to do is trace that problem all the way back and find a heart. And that heart is filled with selfish ambition. And once you find that heart and the, cor- the source of it, just like Korah, was the one man source that affected all these people. Now, the two, just for the sake of time, to give you what happens really quickly, is the 250 that brought censors, they were not, they were not priests. 
So they were, they were messing around with things they were not called to do. And fire came out from the Lord. The earth opened up for Korah, Dathan, and Abiram and their families. But fire came out for the 250, and they died on the spot. And the Lord tells Moses to tell Aaron to go pick up those censers, beat them flat, and then to attach them to the altar so that they become a memorial. That every time people come to the house of the Lord to make an offering, and they see those plates that are hammered out, and they're on the altar, and the kids say, hey, where are all those plates, Dad? Well, those are the 250 people that decided they were going to be priests, and God didn't like that so much. So you just, you know, what you're called to, you're called to. What you're not called to, just leave it alone, and there's, just be content with your life. But you would think at this point, wow, what, a, what an emotional week, huh? I think Moses and Aaron woke up that next morning like, wow, I mean, the earth's opening up, swallowing people, 250 people died, and, and surely the congregation, right? Surely the congregation says, well, you don't you don't want to try to reject God and what he's set up, correct? But check this out. They don't learn the lesson, for it says in verse 41, On the next day all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. You say, Are you for real? The very next day, I mean, the earth's opening up, swallowing people, 250 people are killed with fire, and the next day the whole congregation shows up. I think Moses slept in that morning. What do you think? He was emotionally exhausted. He gets up in the morning thinking, wow, this is going to be a peaceful day. Got his cup of coffee, and he goes out to a crowd going, hey, you killed the people of the Lord. He's like, I I didn't kill anybody, man. God does what he does. He's God. I'm I'm just his servant. And so because of this, just to narrate to the end of the chapter, God brings his plague upon the congregation to discipline them. And 14,700 die in the plague. And he tells Aaron, take a censer, run out, get between the people that have been affected by this, this rebellion, and stand between the living and dead as an intercessor. And so Aaron did, and he ran out, and he stopped the plague to intercede, but not until 14,000 uh, 700 died, and with the other 250 and the rest of those included, probably close to 15,000 died. But you know what? You and I have an intercessor because, as I said, God's word's a mirror. And I can't share this with you today. If you have any kind of adult maturity, you realize at different times you and I have been that rebel. You and I have been the one that caused problems. You and I have been the person that rose up and said, how dare that person in authority? How'd they get that place? And you, once you surrender, you guys, once you surrender to the reality that God places authority in our lives to help us grow and to submit, he just does. Last night, a brother in the Lord came up after the message. He was really struck by the message. And he said, I just got to tell you my story, Pastor. He said, I was at a company, the company that I'm with currently, and I had been with them for years. And he said, for years, I was stuck at the same spot, and I always just grumbled and complained and wondered, how come that manager above me gets to be the manager, and and I know as much as him, and he's not that smart. And he said, I had this attitude for years and years, and he said, I was stuck. And he said, one day, about two years ago, he said, the Spirit of the Lord, he started walking with Christ, the Spirit of the Lord convicted him and said, why don't you just submit to the authority I put in your life? And he said, you mean not kick and scream and grumble and complain and be, you know, and I was like, he goes, yeah. And he goes, okay, Lord, let's see how, what that looks like. And he thought to himself, his whole perspective changed, and there was a couple of managers over him, and he thought, well, obviously these guys are managers for a reason. They must know something, so I'm going to learn everything I can. And all of a sudden, his perspective, it was just a couple of degrees in his perspective that he changed and said, I'm going to learn everything I can. He said, within one year, I've become a manager of my own store. One year. He said, for years and years, I was stuck. He wasn't stuck because of the managers in control, because what the managers in control saw was a person that's attitude was all wrong. They don't want to promote that. They don't want to promote that. And he said, but as soon as my heart changed, a year later, I was promoted. Another brother in the Lord that was here at the 930 service, he shared with me this uh, about a year and a half ago. He said, you know, I I grew up in trouble with the law my whole life, and I spent a lot of my adult life in prison. And he said, but I got saved when I was in prison. And when I got saved, I was working, uh, he was working in this detail. I can't remember if it was the cafeteria or the laundry. And uh, his supervisor came in and said, you've got to do A, B, and C, or else. And, And the rebel in him, his whole life, he rebelled. That's why he was in jail most of his life. He just wanted to rebel against it. And he said, for the first time, because I had given my life to Christ, the Spirit of God ministered to my heart, 
if you'll just submit to him, it will go well with you. And he said, for the first time in my entire life that I can ever remember, I submitted to the authority above me. And he said, man, the rest of my time in jail, I had this great job. I didn't lose it because of my own rebellion. He said, what a blessing that the Lord Jesus did that work in my life. And I know people that have been Christians for years. And they chafe and they fight and they kick and scream always with the authority that's just above them. Not recognizing, you know the reason it's even there? Because God put it there. Our Lord Jesus was the ultimate example of submission. He was innocent and sinless, and he submitted to the will of the Father to go to a brutal cross for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising its shame, and he gave us an example. And ultimately, Peter uses that as people serving their employers. You want to check it out in 1 Peter chapter 2. It's an incredible example. And he said, Jesus is our example. And when you surrender and you discover that submission and sweet fellowship with God, and when you have troubles, when you want to complain or you get angry or you get frustrated, you tell God all about it in prayer. You do talk about it. You just do it in prayer, not with the people around you. And so the reality is, is that you and I, once we discover that God has allowed things in our life, submission to authority in our life, I have went through life and I can look back and see all of the authority that God has had in my life and how I had to submit, how I had to endure, how I had to, in brokenness sometimes, in tears, because of my own frustration and my own rebelliousness, deal with the issues of my own heart. That's why I watch people, they go from job to job to job to job. And every job, the manager's a, a, an imbecile and a jerk when you talk to him. Ah, he's such a jerk. I, you know, I took this other job and I thought I would be better. And, so on, and they move on. And two years later, yeah, it's good. It's, you know what the common denominator in all those jobs are? Is you. You. Check out the mirror. Because if you want to excel in any job, you are going to be respectful and you're going to have a good, obedient attitude. It's that, that old gospel hymn. There's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen? There's no other way. That doesn't mean, you, you know, it's America. You can quit this job and go over there. You can move from this church. You don't like the, the, the leadership. You can go over to that church. God bless you. But realize everywhere you go, you take yourself. You take yourself. When people come to our church, and it's maybe their first time, oh, church is great, and they'll go on and on, and then they proceed to tell me why the pastor down the street is such a jerk. I always knowingly smile because I know and within six months I'll be on that same list. Because no matter where they go, that's the deal. That's the routine. Because nobody's as holy as they are. Nobody's as godly as they are. Nobody's as led by the Spirit as they are. Nobody's as in tune as they are. You're like, right, I can see I'm going to be right on that list along with you, the other pastor. When is it in our hearts that we finally face the Korah inside of us? And we say, Lord Jesus, be our intercessor. What I need is a new heart. I need a new heart, I need a new attitude, I need a new perspective. God, forgive me for the rebel inside. I don't want my family swallowed up in a pit because of my own stupidity and my own mouthiness. You know, so many people I've met over the years, jaded church kids, they've grown up in church, but they grew up in church with a family. Mom and dad did nothing but mean mouth the church their entire life growing up, and they get to be adults, and they want absolutely nothing to do with the church because they listen to their mom and dad mean mouth the church their whole life. And mom and dad didn't even realize what they were destroying. What they were destroying was the faith in the heart of a child about the work of God. Some of us are just as destructive. Some of us. have taken people down a road that is not good. So we face it. I have to face the rebellion in my life. I have to face who I am. I have to come to a brokenness and a place of surrender and submission in my walk with God and my walk with others. And a place of brokenness and submission is a place of beauty and strength that God can work with in anybody's life from the day you make that decision. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that by your spirit, you would speak to our hearts, you would speak to our lives, you would transform us now. 
Lord Jesus, as we turn to you as the guest of honor of this entire service and for communion, Lord, as we remember your body that was given for us and your blood that was shed for us, Lord, we pray that you would meet us. And Lord, we know deep in our hearts that each one of us, there's a rebel inside that wants to kick against authority, that wants to divide and conquer and want positions that are out of our reach. So Lord, please forgive us and wash us and cleanse us and empower us by your spirit. Live your supernatural life inside of us to transform us, Lord, so that we can be the people you want us to be by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.